I warned you. <laughs> cool. And now it's time for us to officially start. Uh, once again, let me introduce today's speaker. So Tan May Goyle, uh, as I mentioned before, he is working uh, at the big company in Rakuten. He's a product manager at Rakuten. And also he is volunteering at the Japan-based startup uh, called by Mizu. And he's going to talk today about the product management, uh, how he got into that industry, how he ended up uh, being a product manager and about different myths that exist in this industry and how to become a product manager as well. Cool. And so without you, I am giving this microphone to our speaker. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Sasha, for that great introduction. And um, firstly, thank you everyone for joining the event today. I see some familiar faces, so uh, that makes me a little more nervous, but let's, let's start. Okay. Um, so let me share my screen. I hope everyone can see my screen well. And um, while I give my introduction, um, I just want to start, as Sasha mentioned, there, there would be some polls. So this would be the first poll. And uh, it would help me try to understand what the audience is today so that I can curate the talk a little bit better. So if you can see the poll, please uh, fill it out. And uh, once we have enough people, I'll also share it. Um, okay. And in the meanwhile, welcome to this talk, the roller coaster world of product management. And the reason I call it roller coaster is because um, every day seems kind of really crazy in this in this kind of career, but that's really fun. And the reason of this talk is to try to explain to people why why that is, and maybe to give some more context and clarity to this role, which seems to be everywhere in tech, but no one really knows what happens. Um, okay, so we have about, I'll still wait for like 10 seconds more for people to fill out the poll. But yeah, so based on this, let me talk about what eventually would be the takeaways for the audience today. Um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you would be able to know if being a PM is for you. So, um, what is a product manager and what's the mindset of, of one? Um, and this is very interesting because as Sasha mentioned, I'm working for both Rakuten as well as volunteering for MyMizu. So at the same time, I'm in a big tech company as well as a startup uh, doing the same role. And when I, got, when I started thinking about it, the stuff I do is same, but also very different. And the way I, way I uh, experience this role in both companies is also really different. So I really wanted to share some differences. And finally, if after all that, it seems like it's something you really want to do, then it would be really great to um, see the last section, which is about uh, how you could become a PM as well. So let me end this poll. And uh, as you can see, so we have about 30% people here are software engineers or developers. We have some students here as, as well. And we have some entrepreneurs. And it's really nice to see some product managers as well. Um, yeah, so we have a good mix of everyone. So that, that makes it really nice because I think I can really give a good uh, elaboration on the different kinds of topics. Now, I, based on the takeaways I mentioned today, I just want to share another question, which is which part seems most interesting to you and maybe the reason why you joined this talk. So yeah, if you could fill out that poll as well. Um, and in the, uh, can you guys see this poll? The second one that I shared. Okay, I anyway, just see uh, the results. Yeah. Ah, okay, one second, sorry. Let me try it again. Okay, I think this should work now. Yeah, okay, great. So yeah, based on the takeaways, here's the agenda. So I would be starting off by talking about like what my story is and how I ended up in product management. And it's very um, interesting and like topsy-turvy journey. Secondly, then I'll be trying to talk about what is a product manager and what it isn't, uh, what kind of skills you might need and what do they actually do. Then the section would be kind of talking about PM in big tech versus startups. And uh, finally, uh, how you could become a product manager. All right, so based on this poll, I see that a lot of people are interested in the big tech versus PM, uh, big tech versus startup section and also how to become one. So I'll try to focus more on that and kind of um, skim through the introduction as well as PM meaning. But I think it's good to have that context as well. All right, thank you so much everyone for your participation till now. And let's go into it. And um, 
after some sections, I will take like a small break in which I would be really happy to answer any questions or any concerns that you guys might have. And hopefully, so let's start by my journey into PM. Um, so as you can see, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, I started studying, did a bunch of internships, had some entrepreneurial uh, experience, and then eventually become a product manager. But um, like, it's not that simple. And I really wanted to delve a little bit deeper into each of these points as to what made me end up in product management, because I didn't even know about the role all the way until one month before I applied to Rakuten. So, so why is that? And how did I end up doing this? Let's see. So we start off in 2015, where I decided to, and I saw some, there's someone from Hong Kong here as well. So I studied at uh, HKUST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And um, I decided to study computer science as my major. And the reason that was, I enjoyed math and science. It's a very um, Indian brown person thing. Uh, um, and then at that time, CS was a really hot field. Um, many entrepreneurs, uh, especially in India, which was a huge hub for tech, uh, they were CS majors. But within the first year, I kind of realized that I was just studying computer science and I wasn't like applying it. How is the theoretical stuff that I'm learning right now going to make help me make mobile apps or software or even like do some uh, data science or AI algorithms? And honestly, I wish I had some something like Leywagen at that time because I think that's a more practical approach to studying computer science. But well, I had I didn't know about that at that time. So I was just kind of like learning computer science theoretically. And so then I decided, okay, the, the best way to understand is, is to do some kind of internship. So I did an internship in a web development company in India. It was a startup. It was actually a unicorn startup. So it was super popular. But immediate, immediately, once I started doing it, I realized it was not intuitive to me. Like I got some kind of tasks and problems. I knew what I wanted to do in my mind, but I didn't have the technical skill or I didn't have the aptitude to actually like convert it into code. So that was like the first big red flag for me. Secondly, like my always my focus used to be on why, like why are we doing this task? Because usually you would get the task and like most of the people, they would just do it. Um, and I always kept asking my manager about like why, uh, sorry, the opposite. Like, um, so we were all thinking about how to do it, but I always kept asking my mentor at that time, why are, why do we have to do this? What, what results would it bring, et cetera? Who's making this decision? Um, that was one key point. And thirdly, like I wanted more human to human communication. I wanted to, uh, experience more like talking and bouncing off ideas, um, and I did not feel so comfortable sitting in front of like a terminal and coding all day, um, which I know some people are really, really love that as well. So, but that was just not for me. So then what happened? So then next year I was like, okay, maybe computer science isn't for me. I'll still complete my degree, but maybe I'll go into a more business facing role. And so I decided to do consulting and um, Consulting gave me the, the experience to do problem solving and communication a lot. Like there was no doubt that it had a lot of that. It matched my skill set, but um, mainly what happened was, okay, we thought of these solutions and it's done. We move on to the next project. Um, I was not very happy leaving behind these recommendations. I really wanted to see through the execution. Whether it was even done or not. And just another small point was like, um, I was traveling a lot for consulting and I did not have any control over my work-life balance. So that was something I felt I uh, wanted more than like that corporate life or even like a huge paycheck. Like I wanted more control over my time. So then now what, right? I've done something in tech. I've done something on the business side. Um, still not able to find what I really want to do. So in my third year, um, usually in Hong Kong, everyone starts applying to in the investment banks because it's a finance hub. But I was really interested in entrepreneurship right from the get-go. And um, I decided to use the summer of my third year to like st do something of my own. And uh, I tried to like do some, uh, solve this problem I saw in e-commerce. And to explain that, it would take a whole nother session. So uh, maybe we can talk about it later. But eventually the favorite part in that whole entrepreneurship journey was building the actual platform with engineers. 
And that was something I really enjoyed doing because it didn't involve me coding, but it did involve me to stay in the tech, like do problem solving, try to figure out how we can solve these issues uh, of our users in the best way possible and also work on the user experience. Um, and I wanted to really do this full time. And that was my plan as well. But I, I was spending too much time on it even during the semester and I decided I really need to graduate. So I decided to take a break from the startup. Um, but the whole part about um, finding the user's needs, uh, deciding what features to be built and you know, like how the UX should be, that was something really interesting. And I wish I was trying to find if there's a role I can do similarly in other companies. And similarly, at the same time, I took this course called Human Computer Interaction. And this, this was the turning point, I would say, in my university experience, because all throughout university, we were just um, like reading theoretical stuff and then doing some programming assignments. But this was the course which told me, okay, like you can actually think of solutions outside of feasibility. Like just think of the best possible thing you could do. Dream about how to solve these problems rather than thinking about the feasibility. Um, because tech will always catch up. It's always about trying to figure out how, how the best way to solve the problem is. And also it also told me that aside from software itself, um, the user experience is also equally important and there are people working full-time on that. So that's how I found out about the job of a product manager. But then the issue was that um, maybe during that time, product manager was not an entry-level role. I was still in university and most of the PM jobs required either two years of work experience as a software engineer, because a lot of people thought that only software engineers could end up being product managers or um, it required an MBA. And uh, I didn't have either and neither did I have the scope of doing either in, right after graduating university. But um, some companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, Rakuten, like the big tech ones which have the resource as well as the core understanding of the need for a product manager for tech, they have uh, junior PM or associate PM programs uh, where they hire uh, students right out of university and then start training them directly in the product management ways. And that was what Rakuten was providing. Although at that time it was for master students, not for undergrad, but I still applied anyway. And I ended up getting in because of my past experiences, especially in my startup. And uh, I was actually the youngest to get it. And for Almost two years, I was the uh, youngest in my team until now we have a new set of new grads coming in. Um, so that was really interesting as well. And I felt that that was a great opportunity and I was really lucky to have it. And fast forward to now. So now I've worked almost more than two years in Rakuten as a product manager, especially in Rakuten Travel. So that's my uh, company and department. And um, after one year, one and a half year of experiencing product management, I was kind of itching to use my skills in a more open environment. And this would be more clear when I talk about the big tech versus startup part. But um, there was a lot of skills I was not able to practice in, in Rakuten. And I was trying to find an avenue where I could do that. And I reached out to the people at uh, my Mizu because that was a um, company and an organization I was following for a long time because I'm also super passionate about sustainability. And there's not a lot of people doing something about that in Japan. Um, and through like discussions and just like bouncing off ideas, I kind of um, pushed my way into this organization. I, I wouldn't say push like they were very welcoming, but I was really like, I was really interested to work with them. And um, after a lot of different projects with them, I kind of become, became a core member as well of that team. So um, that's kind of the two hats I'm juggling. And aside from that, I'm also uh, organizing Product Tank Tokyo events. So it's kind of similar to what Leywagon is doing for software, but it's uh, we have a community of product managers uh, and people interested in products. So we will be doing events about that as well. And we have one next week, which I can talk more about later. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, I've completely immersed myself into product in different parts because the reason is I'm, I really love doing it and I'm super passionate about product and um, I'm really, I feel really happy that I was able to find this right out of university because now I know I don't want to change my career at all. And okay, at this point of time, um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to bounce in. Otherwise I would like to move on to the next section about um, what is a product manager. So let me wait for like maybe 
five or ten seconds. Um, but I maybe there's something in the chat. Let me check it. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Liu or JY. Okay, that's the username. Um, I wonder how how much what you learned in CS helped you in my PM role today. Actually, that's a really good question, and um, I have like a section about it um, in the PM myths part. So hopefully, I can cover that uh, the answer to that in that. So thank you so much for asking that question. All right, let's move on. Um, so what is a product manager? Um, a lot of people might have seen this diagram before, or maybe not. But this was the this was actually made by the most popular like product group in the world, and uh, to explain to people what is a product manager. So as you can see, there's three when there's a Venn diagram with three sections: UX, tech, and business, and somehow product managers between here. However, over a period of time, it's uh, it's become very hard to interpret this. It doesn't tell you what a product manager does, what kind of skills do they need to have, and um, like where do they lie? Because honestly, UX is a core part of tech. Business is a core part of tech and UX. Everything's kind of similar. So like, what, what is this intersection? Um, and yeah, let, so now before we go into what is actually PM, I want to talk about what PM is not. Um, and here are some myths. So this is, so these are all truths. You don't need to have a tech background to be a product manager. Um, People in my team are from business, media, philosophy, psychology, um, all types of backgrounds. Because as a product manager, your skill set does not have to be technical. Um, there are technical product managers as well who would who would need that kind of skill. But um, the skill set for a product manager does not need to. You don't need to know. Um, you don't need to have a tech background or engineering background at all. Second question, second myth, you don't need to know how to code. So I think this is one of the things and we, we had a question as well. So honestly, since I've worked in uh, Rakuten or Maimizu, I have not written a single line of code at all. However, I'm still very involved in the core tech as well as a lot of the major decisions about the features. And here, let me answer the question. Um, it does help. Having coding background or having CS background um, helps because it makes it much easier to speak to the engineers and to get buy-in for your ideas. Because obviously engineers are really smart people and they will question you as to why are you making this decision? Because it may lead to like a huge resource uh, adjustment. It may, do, it may lead to like changing the architecture of the system, et cetera. And um, you need to really be able to like talk in technical language. But that's not something you can learn in university or through coding. It's something that you could build up even as a non-technical background or a coding person. For me, I just had the benefit of having the head start in that, but I still need to keep brushing up my knowledge like anyone else who would be in this uh, industry. So I hope that answers your question. It's a plus, but not necessary. Um, the next myth would be, you don't need to have great design skills. Uh, you don't need to know how to do Figma or uh, you know, like uh, graphic design or even all those things, because there are really smart and talented people to do that. And they are UI and UX designers. What you do need to have is you need to have some kind of design sense. Um, you need to understand that what would make it easier for the users based on the functionality that you're trying to give. And um, one, um, and yeah, basically another thing you might need to know is how to do wireframing and how to like express your ideas in some visual form. So those are important. Um, another point I would like to add is like sometimes your um, you would be a product manager of a product that does not have any UI at all. Like you could be managing uh, an algorithm, you could be managing an API, um, or any sort of form which does not have a user interface. You could be managing a product for Alexa. Um, oh, my Alexa just rang. But um, yeah, like you could have a voice interface. There's no UI, so like you may not need to have UI design skill for that as well. Next one. Product management and project management is not the same. So this one's kind of like my pet peeve. I tell everyone I'm a product manager and they, it seems like they didn't even hear the product part. They just straight go, oh, so what does a project manager do? Um, very different things. Um, and again, it could be a whole talk just talking about that, but just very briefly, product manager um, is a tech core tech person and they would be involved in, the, in deciding um, what the features are to be built and helping in the product development. 
project manager could manage any project. It could be tech or non-tech. And their main focus is to try to make sure that it's on time and uh, the budget and the resource allocation is correct. So it's very different roles and very different skill sets, although there is an overlap. Finally, a uh, product manager is not the mini CEO of a product. So this is something that a lot of people also, you might find online. Um, however, it's not true. It's a good way to maybe explain it to like a five-year-old. That's, uh, that's what I do when I have to tell it to someone young. But um, in a real sense, you do not have any power. Like the, you have the word manager in your role, but you're not managing anyone. Um, you, your main key skill as a product manager is to influence people without authority. And um, that way you cannot be a CEO. CEO is a person who's a, who's a leader of people and leader of a company and their decisions are full and final. Um, another thing is that, um, yeah, basically you cannot, you cannot say that you own every aspect of this product and whatever needs to happen. You need everyone to agree on the points. So now that I've talked about what product management is not, um, now I would like to really go into what product management is and um, what kind of skills do you require? So this is an upgrade from the previous when, when diagram. This is something I made sometime last year based on my personal experiences and a lot of research that I did. And it may look a little overwhelming at first, but it's kind of structured. And um, these are this would give you a, like a eagle eye view on what kind of skills you might require to become a product manager. And um, let me go, oh, before that, one thing is that this is not a final list, like it's very non-exhaustive. And the reason I've put a question mark in the middle for product manager is because even you might have all this, you may still need more. So this, all these does not make you a product manager immediately. However, the one thing is that a, a lot of these skills are, um, Maybe they, they can be gained, not like they're not technical skills. They are a mix of hard and soft skills that can be gained with a lot of experience, as well as like even just talking to people or like trying to do some kind of projects on your own. And I'll come to that later in the how to be a PM section. So if you feel like there's something here that you might not even know or you might be missing, it's completely fine. It's very easy to do it through other ways. Um, so here's the holy trinity of skills that I think are important. Um, like the top three ones under which all the other skills lie. So the first one is user empathy. Um, as a product manager, you need to be able to identify the needs of your users. Um, maybe they know what they need, maybe they don't know what they need, but you need to figure out what they might need. And you need to build the products that solve their problems, but also satisfy business goals. So you can't always put user first because maybe sometimes um, business, like your business goal is more important. So um, that's why so many times you see when you want some kind of feature in your in the apps that you use, like Instagram or this, that um, you don't get what you want because maybe they have a different vision for where they want to take you or the users. So you need to have a good balance between that. But obviously you're building your products for someone. So users need to be in the front line of that. Second one, product vision. Um, so this means that you need to be able to like have some kind of, um, future foresight as to where the industry would go, where your the solutions that you're building would lead to, and um, be able to um, motivate your team to follow that vision and build these kind of sustainable solutions. Finally, um, one second. Yeah, finally, we have effective communication. Um, so this is, I think, one of the most key skills. You should be able to express your thoughts very effectively to a variety of people. Like you are talk every day you are speaking to developers, designers, people from the legal team, people from the business unit, actual users, and so many people. So you need to change the way you talk to each person so that you can speak in their language. And you also need to be able to do it verbally, written, as well as visually. So effective communication, extremely important. And yeah, so the PM, uh, so just to uh, bring it all together, under these three, when you make some kind of intersections, these are more key skills that kind of boils down to uh, UX and design sense, effective prioritization, and passion for technology. This kind of falls under user empathy, X product vision. And then as you can see, we have 
project and stakeholder management. So a product manager is also required to do some, some kind of project management. You need to be really good at maintaining documentation and you need to have good leadership. I think that's also super important. Um, finally, you need to be able to do user testing and iteration. Like you need to be able to understand how your users are reacting to your products and iterate on them. You need to, this is one technical skill that's very handy. You need to be able to analyze data and, um, and actually like you need to be able to collect the right data and analyze it and generate insights out of it. And finally evangelizing, it basically means that you need to be the first person to, to promote your product or your solution. Uh, you need to be the spokesperson and you need to make sure that everyone uh, kind of uh, knows what you're doing in the best way possible because you built it. So you are the one who has to promote it. So as I mentioned, I think Shakespeare said that uh, Jack of all trades is a master of none, but maybe a lot of people don't know that there's, a, it's not the entire quote. It's, but oftentimes it's better than master of one. So as a product manager, you don't need to be the champion in any of these, but having like a good mix of um, these skills is really helpful. And even for me, I'm, I may be decent at some of these, some I really need to work on. Some there's a huge scope of, of improvement as well, which might come in the future. So you need to have a good blend of all these skills so that you could uh, end up being like a effective product manager. Uh, okay, let's see now. Okay, before that, I think there are some questions. So let me check. Uh, okay, so Mario, hi Mario. Uh, you're doing so much at a young age. What is it that keeps you motivated? Um, like that's a, that's a good question. When you ask that, it feels like I'm not doing enough, but I do understand that, yeah, I, I am putting a lot on my plate. Uh, the thing that keeps me motivated is I'm just super passionate about, the, about what I'm doing. Um, and then it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like, for example, if you have a hobby that you enjoy, like sports or music, um, when you do it, it doesn't feel like you're spending time doing it. It just feels like you're enjoying it. And for me, it stimulates my mind to, to, to like work on these kind of projects. And, um, and basically that's it. Like, so when I'm doing it, I kind of lose track of time and I kind of have to take breaks to make sure that, okay, I'm actually like breathing or sleeping. Um, oh, Mohib is here. Uh, okay. Um, how do you develop a good design sense? Uh, I think you just need to play around with a lot of apps that you use. Um, I think design is slowly starting to get standardized. A lot of apps are using the same kind of flows or features. So just try to like gather the general way of how apps are doing things and see what, what makes you feel good or not. Like, so for example, even if you're using an app like Zoom, does some, is, does some, is something hard to do? Do you think there's an easier way to do it? Um, think about those questions when you're using any apps. I think that's how I started doing. And then once you start doing that, try to find a fix to it. How would you change it? So that's how to do UX. For UI, um, I think it's a technical skill. So I usually let the, the talented UI designers handle that. So I, I don't have a great UI design sense, but UX is super important. All right, Dago, um, do you think there's any difference between product owner in Scrum and product manager? Uh, good question, very uh, theoretical question. Um, yes, obviously there is a difference, but however, I think uh, it depends on what kind of methodology you're using. A lot of companies are not working agile or scrum. So it's, so they do not have a requirement or like a position for product owners. So in that case, product manager actually does both the jobs. However, when some companies are running scrum or agile, then there would be separate roles for product owner and product manager. So in that case, product owner, I may be wrong, correct me. I'm not, I don't theoretically know it. Uh, perfectly but like product owner would be the one managing the backlog like they would be the ones deciding um what goes ahead and then product manager would then take those and then uh have them built using the product development methodology with the team i may be wrong though i i don't know because i've never encountered a product owner um but i hope that kind of gives a context to your question what is the difference between a project manager, product manager, and a scrum master? Um, similar question to the, that one. So a product manager, basically the product manager specifically will work in the product development process. A project manager is responsible for the budgeting and the timeline. 
And a scrum master, if you are doing scrum or agile methodologies, they would be responsible for making sure that the iterations of the scrum is going correctly. I'm being a little technical here, but I hope that the people asking this question, they kind of understand what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, so they, their, their uh, domain is just the scrum. Project manager's domain is just the project and product manager's domain is just the product. So I, I hope that kind of like makes it an easy way to understand. Um, next question, data analytics as in analyzing big data. Um, not analyzing big data per se, but like trying to figure out just for example, um, you, you can see that uh, in, in maybe like a sign up flow on your app, uh, where like how, what percentage of people sign up but then don't you know, do anything further. Why is that? Like you, but to figure out that percentage, you need to like figure out, okay, what are the ways to see um, how many accounts we have uh, as comparison to how many. So for example, in my case, I'm working in a travel booking app. So like how many bookings are being made? What's the difference between that and why? Like, so try to do that kind of analysis. But again, it depends from product to product. Um, the most easiest way to do data analytics is to know SQL. Um, and just query the data you need and then do analytics. So you don't need to do any high level analytics for that. Um, wow, okay, there's a lot of questions. So maybe let me do a little bit more and then come back to these questions in the end because I still have a, the most important section that you guys are waiting for up ahead. So I hope that's okay. All right, Whew. okay, let me get some water as well. Okay, next section. Oh, before that, I have a fun exercise for you guys. Um, kind of talking about UX here. So I saw this going on, on LinkedIn and I thought it was really interesting. Maybe some of you have seen this already, but let me open up a poll question. Um, which UX is better? I have a simple question to ask and I'll just wait for maybe five, 10 seconds to understand. All right, we have almost half the people have participated already. And we can see a clear majority here. A lot of people are saying the right one. Um, so this is very interesting. I, I hope that I would get this answer. Um, the answer is, it depends. You know, you can't just straight away see this and decide what's better. Because think about it. What problem is this UI, UX trying to solve, right? What if I told you this shirt was available in 50 colors. Um, do you think we would have 50 color dots like this? Do you think that would be a good UI or a good UX? Um, or what if I told you that the orange color is the one that's in stock the most, and that's the one we want to psychologically convince the user to buy? So in that case, do you think showing all the colors in the first place is a good idea? Maybe not, right? You want to create some kind of friction so that maybe if the user is in a hurry or they don't uh, know much, but they like the design, they're okay with choosing this kind of color. So this was, yeah, this was some kind of exercise I wanted to show that this is what um, a product manager kind of does. Uh, we cannot jump to conclusions. We really need to go deep into the issue and understand what is the reason and then come up with some kind of relevant solution to that. Um, so I hope that this was interesting. And I think a lot of these are floating around on LinkedIn. Uh, so feel free to like have your own analysis, but I hope this makes you realize that, okay, let's, let's act. So when you're looking at the apps that you're using, if there's a reason it's done that way, because as a, there has to be a product manager behind it, a designer behind it, who decided to do it this way and not the other way around. Um, and there is definitely a reason for that. I can tell you because there's a lot of discussion that goes on in even small things like this. So, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that small activity. Now let's go into what does a PM really do? Um, so this is the definition of a product manager by Marty Kagan, who is basically the godfather of product management. And he wrote the Bible called Inspired. A PM is responsible for evaluating opportunities and determining what gets built and delivered to customers. Uh, very theoretical, very clear. However, it's a very ideal uh, definition. Um, this is kind of the definition I believe in as a product manager. A 
product manager is the person who will just basically do whatever it takes to release the product they envision. This could mean that you, you would be the one testing every scenario. Maybe you, in a startup, you might even have to be the one writing the code or reviewing the code. You have to fight for what you need, what you want to get built. And you need to convince people to do it in a, in a very influential manner. So yeah, basically this is the more practical definition that I believe in. And yeah, this, this is just my verb at um, But in more detail, in a product development cycle, what would a product manager do? This kind of how it looks like. Um, we would be doing a lot of user research, just speaking to our users, trying to see the, um, using data analysis as well to try to see what's happening. Uh, why are we not able to achieve our business goals? Or what do the users really want? Um, these kind of things. And based on that, as well as other things, like maybe there are some bugs running around, maybe the, the executives want some kind of feature in the app, uh, in the service, we gather all the requirements. So we bring everything into one place to try to analyze, okay, what should be the next things that next features that need to be built. Then we have to manage the solutions and prioritize, prioritize them. So prioritization is really, really important because if you have 10 things you want to do, you can't do all 10 of them. You definitely don't have the resource and time to do that. What is the best two things or the best three things you can do at this point of time that will make the most amount of impact? And obviously there's some things going to go wrong. So then out of those three things, what's the best one thing that you want to do and what are the concessions you're like willing to make? So that's also a very important part. Um, Defining the specifications. So this also is something that, uh, especially as a junior PM, you will do a lot. Um, you will be actually defining the user flows. You will be defining the functional specifications. Basically, end-to-end, -end, what's going to happen when user clicks this button, what it should show, what, should, what data should it uh, bring, and everything. So that's where documentation is really important and communication. Then once you have defined, you've decided what you want to build, build and you've defined the spec, then you will be supporting the developers and the designers to actually build it. So developers and designers will be asking you many questions about, okay, what happens if this, they'll bring out some things you may not have thought about and you need to think of some answers on the spot. Sometimes they'll be confused. Okay, maybe this is a better way of doing it. Why are we doing it this way? So you need to like kind of defend your argument or maybe uh, say, okay, you are right. So we need to do it that way. So basically you are, um, you are there with the developers and the designers throughout the whole uh, process of actually building your product. Then you have to test, do testing. So in many, many teams, you might have a testing team as well. Um, but many teams, you, you would be the one to do the testing. So you need to like develop the test cases and see, okay, what are the main things we need to check before we release? And then it comes to the releasing and the marketing. So you need to make sure that, okay, um, the time and the, the, the timing of releases is, is accurate. It will make the most amount of impact. You would work with the marketing team or the sales team to make sure that um, like the, way, the, the core aspect of this release is being um, you know, portrayed in the right way in the marketing or this kind of things. And once you release, you are back to the, to the round one and then you keep doing the cycle again. And if you're, as a product manager, you're not just handling one product, you'll be handling like five or six or 10 products at the same time. So for each product, you will be at a different stage in this cycle. So multitasking, multi-management is also really important as a product manager. Um, okay. Now, just I'll brief through this quickly. What I do at Rakuten. Uh, so if you guys don't know about Rakuten, it's a, it's a big e-commerce tech company in Japan. and um, so I'm part of a 15 member PM team. So like there's 15 other PMs in my team and then the entire team size of my depart, like of my, just my team, not even my department is more than hundred, like including developers, business unit, et cetera. Um, so that's a lot. And there's a lot of PMs working on this and our product is kind of like a, a premium hotel booking platform, which is kind of like a, a POC of a much bigger project that we're working on. Um, and in this, I kind of, uh, I'm responsible for like some specific features, uh, end to end, uh, experiences, like for example, notifications, uh, coupons, guest reviews, etc. So if there's anything related to guest review, people know they have to come ask me and I have to make those decisions. Same, same with that. 
um what i do at my mizu so my mizu is maybe like 20 members however like a lot there's only maybe four or five full time members everyone else is volunteering which is really great like that's that's how big that's how great of their mission is that people are willing to put in their time and our tech team or our our tech team literally has four people in it um we have our cto me um one we have a ux design intern and we have maybe one ui design that's it um rest of the um rest of the tech team comes and goes and right now we actually have some developers working with us so that's really great uh, um but yeah so it's a very small team and i'm basically the only person who's handling from a product sense and uh, if you already don't know about my mizu we are building uh like app services and kind of generating a lot of um how to say like awareness around saving like reducing single usage plastic in japan which you know is a big issue um and uh, basically here i'm doing everything a product manager does plus what a senior product manager would do plus what a product lead would do so i define the vision like where do we what do, what kind of feeling do we want our apps and services to give i maintain the entire feature backlog um even do hiring when needed implement the processes doing all the actual work of a product manager and then yeah like trying to find some time to sleep if if i can um that's just a joke i i have enough sleep <laughs> but yeah okay let's go into big tech versus startups um i try to do it by themes so team and mentorship very interesting concept <clears throat> in big tech we have a lot of experience and domain expert members we we have i have a dedicated manager who is my mentor as well as senior manager uh, who have like almost 10 to 15 years of product management or uh, product experience and there's so many other product managers almost like more than 200 or 500 product managers in rakuten itself who are available to you at your disposal um to talk to and understand which you may not be able to do um as an outsider um in a startup you're on your own um like learning comes from trial and error or experimentation there's no one to tell you what's what you should do or what could be the right or wrong answer um you reflect a lot and you try to figure out how to like how, how to do better next time and you always obviously learn from your advisors uh, the founders of the team they're really smart people as well as well as external sources so um if i don't know anything while i'm working in my project at rakuten i i'm really thankful that my manager is always there to guide me and help me based on his past experience and his domain knowledge if i don't know anything in my mizu well um let's just see what happens and and hope nothing bad happens and figure it out uh based on the result so that's kind of my mental model when i'm uh thinking in both roles next one processes so big tech even when i joined they had very clear process uh, of doing things lots of documentation like you could get lost in the in so much documentation but you could find what you're looking for if you looked hard enough because someone or the other wrote something that's helpful however it could be outdated or maybe it's it's too inertial like it doesn't move forward um that's one one like small uh pain point of the process having like all these established processes startup no process bare minimum sometimes it's even chaotic because everyone's not aware of what's happening or where they lie in the whole system um but you have the liberty to build your own processes as you go and switch whenever you please so that's something we have the flexibility to do and because there's less people and um you have kind of you can train everyone really quickly and do it um so a lot of learning forgetting relearn so just just as an example um when uh so in in rakuten we currently use teams as our chat platform um and if i wanted to use slack that's basically impossible for me to facilitate because it would require an insane amount of a hierarchy and processes to go through and like keep convincing people to do those kind of things so it's kind of hard so that's when i'm in inner show it doesn't it's not so easy to move forward um but like in in a startup your team could switch from google drive to notion in one day if they wanted um so that's kind of the flexibility you have or like you could you could make sure like if you have a 10 step process you could just do a, in you have you have a 10 step process in big company you could have a three step process in in the startup to remove the um the redundant steps 
All right, next one, risk, very big one. So big techs obviously have lower risk tolerance. Obviously it depends from company to company. Um, but when you've established yourself, you cannot compromise on quality. So you'd rather delay your products than um, release something that may not be at the perfect way of your, like your expectation. And um, it has the flexibility to absorb the mistakes and improve. So like if I made some mistake or if I defined something incorrectly, it would get caught in testing and then it might, our product might get delayed, but at least that mistake won't go live. Um, so there's that level. So I really like it because it's kind of like a playground uh, to really experiment with different things without having like a huge risk because there's always someone to help you out. Um, but timelines are long and have a fixed scope. So like I already know that I'm working on this one year project um, that just will solve this problem. Um, but in startup, it's basically release first, fix later. Speed is important and putting yourself out there is important because you need to know what the people are thinking and you need to keep improving. Um, mistakes are made in public. So if, if something happens, it's out there, but uh, hopefully you have the sense to fix it and then not make it again in the future. Timelines are tight and requirements could change very quickly. Like for example, in my Mizu sometimes, um, like our, our founder comes and says, okay, we have this uh, collaboration with some company coming up in one month. So we need to do this. Um, we need to finish this. We need to have this ready by one month. And she herself got to know it yesterday. So, so that's like something really interesting. Um, and it's really uh, interesting to manage both as well. Then next one, resources. So this is also really interesting. Um, big techs have an insane amount of resources because they have a very regular stream of revenue. A lot of manpower. Like, as I said, we have a hundred member team. We have so many developers and testing team. Each of them are really smart people and they, um, they are really like, we, we are really able to make build good quality products. Uh, employee stability. So you can expect them to stay for a long time, which is also really great because then once they understand or you build a good rapport with them, um, you can easily work really well with them and losses can be absorbed by the revenue stream so just for example i work in rakuten travel and last year was not a great year for the travel industry however it did not affect our team at all because other other com other departments in rakuten like the e-commerce section or the finance fintech section were doing really really well so like we still got decent bonuses which was nice um in startups, irregular flow of revenue, that's very obvious. Um, human resource is very hard to find and retain. So that's something we've been dealing with uh, in Miami Zoo as well. But um, it's, it's shogunized. So shogunai is a term in Japan we use, like it can't be helped. So we just do the best with what we have. And as a product manager, you should be able to optimize and use whatever resource you have to build the most impactful product. So that's something that um, we have to do in the startups. And finally, idea buy-in. This is really important as a product manager. Um, in a big tech, if you're in a junior level role, very hard. Um, although it depends on your managers, how, how, um, interest, how interested or like passionate are they for your, to push your idea up, up, up there. But there's no way for you to directly reach the top and uh, suggest something. Um, and that's just the way big companies are built. So some of you who work here would know that. Um, startup, uh, I speak to the CTO and and the founders like on a very regular basis because it's it's us it's just us in the tech team so whatever ideas i have um they go straight um straight into discussion and then approval or what whatever like we collectively decide so it's really easy to get buy in that so if if that's the kind of person you are and you really want to have control over your ideas startup but um if you feel like you would like to learn first or you are okay with not having all of your ideas discussed or approved, then big tech would be interesting as well. All right, um, now that I've talked about differences, let me just quickly go through the common benefits of being a PM in both these kinds of companies. You gain a micro and macro scope of learning. So in both, you'll have a great domain uh, experience and knowledge. Obviously you're building great products that create positive impact. So that's something that is my personal um, more like, um, ethic, ethics or something like that. Like I want to work in some kind of um, organization that's doing this. So um, yeah, so that's very important to me. 
work is never boring as i mentioned it's a, it's like a roller coaster every day there's fires to put out people to talk to uh, no day is the same like i tried writing an article about a day in the life of pm and i could not because i could not generalize it at all um skills are easily transferable and create synergy so like the skills i learned from being in a big tech they help in my mizu the the skills i learn or the creativity i get from my mizu i try to apply it in rakuten as well and change things there so so yeah that, those are the common benefits okay now let me quickly go through some questions um all right so how do you relax and recharge to avoid burnout um so i think that's again as you said it, it's everyone ways and methods um i personally really like to do like good prioritization so every month i'll select like two or three things that i really want to put all my effort and energy in so it's not like i would always put my all my energy into say um like my mizu every month so some months i put in extra some months i try to take a step back and it also depends on the situation same with work some months at work are relaxing which allows me time to do other stuff especially doing work from home some months are really intense so then you have to completely prioritize it so as a product manager prioritization is super important and i try to have a good social life as well as like hobbies and stuff like everyone so yeah prioritize could you briefly run through your typical work day at rakuten uh i'm sorry i cannot because it's every day is different but what happens is it usually involves a lot of uh, meetings with different stakeholders so that product development cycle i explained that's basically i'm doing that for some feature at every point of time how do you analyze, analyze data to measure success um so i think it it depends on your um on your goals like what are you what what is your definition of success and based on that you need to select the right kind of data and then see what it means so uh, we could go deeper into this at some other point of time sunil um you work at rakuten too so we can talk how do you handle deadlines and anxiety um i think we all need an answer to that question um but yeah again prioritization uh, anxiety i think you really need to have a good mental mental self so try to do things that make you feel peaceful uh could be meditation um or could be sports could be hobbies so yeah if you can control your anxiety you can have a clear mind to prioritize how closely do product and marketing teams collaborate typically um it depends on the company so i think in uh companies like google um they have product managers and product marketing managers who or even facebook they work very closely together because um the product that's being built um the product ma marketing manager also has a say in the product that's being built and the product manager would have a say in how to market it um and then okay let's see how do you defend your arguments with the designer and developer um data so data is really important if you have like actual user data to or like some reference from any other service um that's really great otherwise you need to build trust if you've had some good wins in the past then the de designer or developer trusts you that okay even if they don't understand what you're doing they trust you that you are making the right decision because they know that you are a good skilled product manager um interesting i'm working for american tech but there's not so much documentation here the document is a kind of ringi show is that a japanese word i and i may not know what it means but the documentation we have is like um especially about our product specifications or it could even be simply about okay how like how do you want to um like what are your reasons for prioritizing bugs or tickets because maybe someone leaves and then someone takes over how are they supposed to like take like hand over or like someone new comes in so we always in rakuten we try to keep a lot of documentation about whatever we are doing because that helps the future person to come in and like take it take over really quickly how do you learn japanese language to work for rakuten you don't need japanese so that's the reason i'm here otherwise i would not be able to do that um so however if you want to work for amazon um maybe you need jlpt level 1 and 1 which is the highest one so it depends but if you're working at rakuten or i have friend working in uniqlo or uh, mercari or some other like companies which they don't require uh, japanese so that's a huge boom for tokyo and japan tech in general a lot of people can get opportunities here 
All right, um, final question. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we are almost at time, but I would like to take 10 more minutes just to go through the end, end part of me, how to become a product manager once I answer this question. So if you guys have time, please stick around. I come from a humanities background with entrepreneurship experiences. What suggestions would you have making a career pivot? Um, yeah, I have a slide just for that. Um, so hopefully you can stick around. Um, and okay, let me hold off on Joey's question for just one second while I complete this. And then whoever has questions, they can stick around. We can have a good chat. All right. Um, why choose a career in product management? Um, it's a very hot role right now. Um, every day I get recruiters messaging me about in, in especially in Japan, it's been slow to like uh, ex manage UX kind of role because they were business oriented companies. But like every every company, especially if it's tech, you will see roles for product management uh, for all domains and aspects of it. So and it's open to anyone. As I said, you don't need to have a tech background. So as a software engineer, maybe you need to know how to code. But as a product manager, whatever you're doing. If you have the right skill set, you can do it. Skill, and then your skill set is transferable to any domain or industry, lots of variety. You want to work in a video streaming company, you could go to Netflix. You want to work in social media, you could go to Instagram or TikTok. You want to work in travel, Airbnb, Rakuten Travel. Um, whatever domain you like, like whatever industry you like, you could become a product manager in that. So there's not, there's really like you can do anything you want. Career path is very well structured. Um, you can go into multiple industries as well if you get bored, which I don't think that's that's very easy. But um, yeah, so you could become a like venture capitalist later. You could become a product consultant. Um, but like you have a career path from junior product manager all the way to chief product officer, all set up in most companies. And finally, this is my favorite part. Um, it's a great training ground for future CEOs and entrepreneurs. Um, and let me tell you why. This is my favorite slide of the whole thing. I hope you recognize all these people. Um, they were all product managers before they became CEOs of companies, except for Steve Jobs, who was, wasn't a product manager by role, but he was a product, for, he was always a product first CEO. So Sundar Pichai, Google, he used to, he was a product manager for Chrome and Android. He was the one who decided that Google should have its own browser and its own operating system. And obviously that led to him becoming CEO of Google. Satya Nadella, he used to uh, manage the cloud, Azure cloud platform. And that's one of the biggest, um, like biggest cash cows of uh, Microsoft. Um, the person you see here, uh, she's who, I cannot pronounce her last name, but she's the CEO of YouTube. And she started off as a product manager at Google where she was handling AdSense, which is also one of the biggest cash cows of Google. Marissa Mayer, she, is the, she was the CEO of Yahoo. But before that, she was the, I think she was the 20th employee in Google. And she was the one who, who was handling search, Google search. She was the product manager for that. So you know how, like, how important search is to Google, obviously. And these two other people, maybe you don't know them by name or face, but this is Ivan Zhao. He was the he is the CEO and founder of Notion, which is one of my favorite so services right now. Um, and he was also a product manager before he decided to start this company. And this is Stuart Butterfield. He is the CEO and founder of Slack, and he was also a product manager. So as a product manager, you can get the correct set of skills that could end up you being promoted to a CEO of your company or your startup. Um, or you could start your own thing afterwards because you have the right set of skills. So I think this should be the biggest inspiration for me as well as anyone else who wants to get into this career. Um, how to build up these skills. So let me, so this would also answer uh, jy.leo's question. Um, so firstly, absorb knowledge from all directions. You coming to this talk is actually your first step into building up the skill because now you have kind of like a foundation as to what you can do, what it is. Read books, uh, listen to podcasts, watch you people, big product people on YouTube giving talks um, and just talk to as many product people as you can so that you can start gen like getting these small, um, how to say, like uh, key points as to what you should be doing. Do side projects. I think that's the most important, especially if you're not already in a tech 
or um, product role uh, already. So side projects would be like try to find, try to do UX case studies. Like I mentioned, use apps that you like or don't like and see how they can be improved. Um, try to work with, try to find developers who you can actually build products with. Uh, build no code products. There's so like you could actually build a whole mobile app without doing a single line of code or a website or service or anything. Um, find problems out there and then find their solutions. I think that's the best way to build up your product skill. And finally, once you have that knowledge and you've tried to apply it in your pro projects, you can also apply it in your current job. So even if you're not in a tech facing uh, role, in the end, product management is finding a problem and solving it for who use do some kind of process service project whatever so think like a pm always I always have a, a problem and so problem oriented user facing mindset and try to apply your the skills that you've learned on how you can creatively solve those problems and create some kind of sustainable solution and finally how to actually find a job in product management the best way, I would say, if you're already working in some kind of corporation, internal transfer. Uh, it's the easiest because it gives you access to all the product managers in your um, company. You could find them in your directory and just reach out to them. Uh, product managers are some of the most talkative and communicative. They're always looking to talk to new people and learn more because we really love learning. So we would always be interested to talk to you, especially if you're willing, if you if you are interested, because um, we would want to share the knowledge um, and talk to them about how you could do it, what, it, what are the requirements, et cetera. That's the easiest way. Next best way would be networking. Um, you could go onto the job websites um, and find roles, but actually from my experience, not all the roles are out there. Uh, some can be created based on your passion. Like that's what happened at my Mizu as well. Um, they did not have any openings or they were not asking for a role, but I reached out to them and tried to show my passion and that's how I got involved. So network and reach out to people that you think would be helpful, even just to have a conversation. Referrals, again, I think in generally in the job searching industry, referrals are the best way to get a job. Um, if you would like to work at Rakuten in our team, we are always looking for people. So please feel free to, uh, to reach out to me later. And even if you would like to work uh, volunteer or work in my Mizu, um, super, super excited to have, have you for that as well. So please reach out to me for either. Um, next step is obviously recruiters and LinkedIn. So like in LinkedIn, you have a way to like make yourself available to recruiters for specific positions and jobs. So that way recruiters will send you uh, messages and then you can talk to them. And finally, the usual job process. So when nothing else works, obviously you just apply, but According to me, this is the worst way to apply for a job. Uh, now that I am in the industry, I realize that. So try to do the top four if you can. And yes, that's it. Um, wow, well, it's almost been an hour of me talking. Um, and I'm really surprised that almost majority of you guys decided to stay. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much to uh, Sasha and Sylvian from Leywagen for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I'm always, as I mentioned, open for questions or just to say hi. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or email. And, um, I have all my contact information and even some PM resources to get you started on my website. So you could, um, you could, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Yeah. You can use this QR code or, um, I can also share it with you in the chat right now so if you give me one second i'll just quickly put, put that link in and then yeah after that let's do some questions or or talking uh if so if you guys want to stick around please feel free all right so i've put the link in the chat okay and yes that's it let me go back to the chat and obviously at this point of time if anyone wants to like just speak up or um, you know, do anything that's also fine with me. All right. Um, okay, so Joey asked, what is your opinion on user analysis at a startup since there is not a sufficient user base? Um, actually, so the, Sasha, we have time, right? We can stick around. 
Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, but you don't need uh, active users to do user analysis. For example, if right now I'm thinking of an of like a new idea, I can I just want to go out to the people and ask them what they think of this idea. What would they do if I have some kind of prototype? Just show them. They don't need to be all, like your users already. If it's more niche, um, for example, um, if you're working on a some problem for moms to to like have a better relationship with the, or like better manage their children or parents, for example. So that would be your time to go talk to any parents, you know, with that with the children in that age level. Um, you don't need to build a product first. You can just start talking to them already. So obviously, once you do have users, users, and your analysis part comes in. User research and user team can happen at any stage. Um, yeah, my complete agree. Documentation is a metaphorical lifesaver. Um, all right uh okay arsh oh wow okay wow someone from my school is here um are you considering an mba degree now do you think it can help you be a better pm um good question um yeah i think mba it depends what what your purpose for mba is so obviously uh, the reason a lot of people do mba is to get a jump in their career so something that could take you four years to achieve after two years you could go directly into it um and for any like industry investment banking or uh, especially if you want to go into business so like for product managers most of the product managers or the ceos that became product managers they do have a mba degree so i think it's a good step in that direction but it's not necessary um, it will help you become a better uh, leader and it will help you become a better entrepreneur um if if that's something you're looking for and obviously both those skills are very key when you become like a manager of product managers um teresa thank you for attending and um oh wow mitali you're here too okay this is i'm i'm super happy to see a lot of like faces i haven't spoken to in a long time um all right yeah um uh everyone's like thank you so much for attending uh okay more question from Teresa. I'm curious what user testing tools you use. I'm a designer at a startup about to do some user testing. So in Rakuten, um, Rakuten has this um, ideology of like DIY. So we have our own user testing, um, uh, like we have our own analytics tools in house. However, for MyMizu, we are using a bunch of different things that our CTO builds for us. And uh, however, I think one one tool that can be really helpful is Mixpanel. I've been speaking to someone from that um, from that organization who has really showed me what great things their tool can do. So, and if you're a startup, within two years you can actually apply for their grant and get a lot of credits for free. So definitely check that out. Um, all right, I think that pretty much ends the questions. Obviously, if you have more questions to ask me or you just want to like have a follow up conversation, please feel free to reach out to me. But yeah, I'm um, I'm really thankful to be able to share this knowledge. And uh, and my end advice would be, if if you're passionate, do that because uh, like find a job that you're passionate about because you'll be spending almost eight hours of your day, five days a week doing that. So you don't want to do something you don't like. And that's what I realized, and that's why I'm really happy doing what I do. And yes, that's it um thank you so much everyone for joining especially my friends who who are supporting me um please message me later if, if you were there but i you didn't ask a question i really want to know what you thought about this and yeah thanks again to leva again that's it from me thank you so much oh thank you so much emma it was amazing talk as always i i mean when i first spoke to you you really struck me as a very passionate a person uh so yeah thank you so much for uh, giving this nice presentation and of course thank you so much for everyone for staying with us until that late and <laughs> yeah bombing our speaker with so many cool interactive questions it was really nice to have you all as usual um i'm looking forward to seeing you at our next uh events and good luck with your projects uh products sorry Tane. <laughs> Are you muted? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Is it okay if I can plug in one of our product tank events happening next week? 
Yes, definitely. Oh, Go for it. Great. Um, so yeah, if you are interested specifically in UX design, um, so next week we are having an event in product, uh, which is kind of called product management meets UX design, where we have two really talented UX designers and we'll be having like a panel discussion trying to figure out what that role is and what kind of communication happens around that. So, so yeah, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I'll be sharing about it very soon. So please keep in touch. And um, just one more, one more talk. Um, so I'm doing another one in maybe two or three weeks. And that would be more specifically about my journey with MyMizu. So we had a lot of um, really, we had a great, interesting last six months where we developed a lot of interesting solutions to solving plastic misusage in Japan. And uh, I would be really talking about what we did and like, what was our ideology and what was the results of that. So if you're interested to know more about MyMizu, uh, please attend that as well. It's on the 14th of October. I'll give more information in my LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it will be where I'll be talking about that. So yeah, okay. That's it. I'm super exhausted now. <laughs> I can imagine that. So yeah, yeah. Let, let our speaker have a rest and uh, have a great evening for everyone who is based in Japan and Asian time zone. And great afternoon and morning for, the, for those who, who are joining us from different countries. I know we have uh, several people who might be joining us from Europe and maybe from North America. And see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>